Hey guys, Trevor Sullivan here. I am back again with another video on my channel. Thank you so much for joining me. Before we get started, please leave a like on this video if you get something out of it and subscribe to the channel to help me grow this community. And also let me know in a comment what other kind of topics you would be interested in hearing on this channel. So what we're going to be covering in this particular video is how to configure remotes on the LXC client for your LexD hosts. Up until this point, we've been SSHing directly into the Linux server where we're running LXD, and then we just use the LXC CLI locally in order to communicate with that server. But if you are managing a large fleet of LexD servers, then it might be convenient for you to actually configure all of those servers as remotes so that you can access them from a central location, such as your development workstation or laptop or some other management server. So for starters, we're actually going to go back a little bit and talk about a couple of different protocols. If you recall from the video that I did on LexD images, we talked about how we have a couple of different protocols. So we use the Lexi CLI to communicate with the LXD daemon. And then when we download images for virtual machines, we actually download those using a protocol known as simple streams from the images.linuxcontainers.org image server that is publicly available. And there's tons of different images available there, but Simple Streams is specifically intended for servers that are going to publicly be hosting images, and it doesn't allow for the LXC client to communicate with LXD engines or the actual daemon that runs LXD. So that's where the LXD protocol comes into play. When we want to configure a remote as an LXD server, rather than simply an image server that pu publicly hosts images, we can use the LXD protocol as our remote configuration instead of simple streams. All right, so now let's talk about how LXC remotes actually work. So for starters, we have our LXD host, right? We're running Ubuntu Linux here, uh, which is the company that's developing the LXD engine in the first place, Canonical. And they are currently developing LXD to run primarily on Ubuntu Linux, but it does work on a lot of other distributions as well. But I'm just going to stick with Ubuntu for now. And so again, up until this point, from our local development workstation, we've been SSHing into that Linux server. And then we just use the LXC client on the local server, and it communicates to the LXD daemon by using a Unix socket rather than a TCP network listener. So on the LXC client, we can discover the configured remotes by using LXC remote list. This is just going to show us the default list of remotes that are configured on any LXC CLI client. But before we actually connect to a LXD engine across the network, we first have to configure the LXD engine to actually listen on the network. By default, LXD doesn't have a network listener unless you tell the initialization engine that you want to create a network listener. Generally, you don't want to unless you have a specific need to for security reasons as it reduces your attack surface. But if you don't have a network listener configured, you can configure one on the LXD server by using this command right down here, LXC config set core.https address, and then you can simply do colon and then the port number, and that will listen on all network interfaces or all IP addresses on port 8443, which is the default port for LexD. You can configure it to run on a different port if you would like to, but you'll have to remember that when you configure the remote on the LXC client side, you'll have to make sure that you specify the correct network port. Now, we also have to set up a trust relationship between the server and the client. So the server has to know that we are issuing commands from a trusted client. And the way that we do that is by using this command down here called LXC config trust add. And then we can specify when we're prompted for a client name that we want to configure. So each of the clients that's going to be accessing an LXD server should have a unique name. And this will generate a unique token that the client will then use to authenticate to the server. So on the client side, once we've configured the LXD engine, we need to run this command up here called LXC remote add. So we would run this on our dev workstation. 
and we specify a unique name for the remote, and we also specify the network address, which could be a DNS name. It could be a multicast DNS name if you're using Avahi Daemon and you're using maybe Windows or Mac on the client side to do MDNS. It could also be a straight IP address as well if you would like, but that is going to be the location of where the LXD engine is listening, and you will need to specify the port number if you're listening on a non-standard port for LXD. So if you're not listening on port 8443, then you'll need to make sure you tack that on to the address on the LXC client. All right, so if you want to configure additional hosts, you basically just iterate through this process once again. So for each of the hosts in your environment, you'll need to set the network listener on the LXD engine. You also need to add a client trust and then go to the client and add that as a remote host. So it might not be terribly useful if you're just managing a single host. You know, you can just SSH into that one host and run your LXE commands on that single LXD host. Maybe that's not a big deal for you, but when you start to kind of scale things out and you start to add more and more LXD hosts to your environment, it's really useful to be able to connect all of those as remotes from your dev workstation. And then you can run automation scripts using Bash or PowerShell or any other language that you want to in order to issue LXD commands to multiple remote LXD servers. All right, so what are some tasks that you can practice on your own LXD server so that you can get an understanding of how remotes work? Well, for starters, go ahead and install the LXC CLI tool on your Mac OS or Windows client, or if you're using Linux, then great. Go ahead and install the LXC CLI there. And then you can add an LXD server as a remote. We just kind of stepped through that process. It's fairly straightforward, and we're going to take a look at a demo of how that actually works. And then you can update the default remote as well. So if you run an LXC command, you do have to specify a remote under, under some circumstances. But if you just do like an LXC list command to list the current running virtual machine instances on an LXD server, then the default remote is going to be used unless you specify a, an alternative remote. So that's an option that you have on the LXC CLI. All right, so it's time for us to take a look at a demo of how this works. And so what we're going to do is, for starters, I am SSH'd into two different LexD servers here. One of them is called LexD05 right here. This is a Hyper-V virtual machine that's running on my local system here, but technically it's still a remote because it's a different operating system instance than my host OS here. And I also have a bare metal host here named Wyoming, and that's actually on a Wi-Fi network connection. So that's a little bit more kind of real world uh, bare metal LXD remote situation. And then I've got my Windows client here. So if I do $PS version table, I'm running the cross-platform version of PowerShell here, which is called PowerShell Core on the Windows OS here. And I do actually have the LXC client installed on Windows. Now, LXD, the daemon, doesn't work on Windows. Only the LXC client utility works on Windows. And if you're on a Windows system, you can install the LXC CLI by using the scoop install command here. And if you don't have the scoop package manager, you can head over to scoop.sh and there's a one line command that you can run there that'll install the scoop package manager. But LXC is provided as a package for scoop here. So if we do a search for LXC, you can see it's available right here. It's recently up to date as well uh, with the latest version of LXD, which is 515 that's available. So it is available through the scoop package manager. And I strongly encourage you to use scoop to install LXC as well as other development tools because it makes it really easy to keep your tools up to date on a Windows system. So try to avoid manually downloading packages and installing them or manually unzipping them because scoop can handle all of that for you. Now, also, if you're on a Mac OS client, like a MacBook Pro or maybe a Mac workstation, you can use the Homebrew utility here. I don't have a Mac workstation myself, but you can install the Homebrew package manager, and then you can do a brew install on LXC, and that'll get it installed as well. So there's nice package managers for both of those. And then the documentation on LexD also covers this topic on how to configure your remote server and then add that remote server to the LXC client. All right, so back over here, I've already got LXC installed. And if I do LXC version here, I should be able to see I'm running 5.1.5. And so if I do an LXC remote list for starters here, 
you're going to see that the only default remotes that are configured for the LXC CLI are actually the local Unix socket, which doesn't exist because I'm on a Windows platform. But then we also have these simple streams servers. So we have the default images server at images.linuxcontainers.org. And then there's a couple of Ubuntu specific registries as well, or servers that are used in the simple streams protocol as well. And there's some images available on there that aren't necessarily available on the default image server. But as you can see, I don't have any remotes configured. I can't talk to either of my LXD servers right here using the LXC CLI until we go through and perform the configuration. And I just want to show you what would happen if we do an LXC remote and then try to register a new remote. So let's do this add command here. And you'll see that we can specify an optional name here as well as an IP address or a DNS name. So if I do an add and say LXD05 and then LXD05.local would be the MDNS address, we're gonna see that the connection is ultimately refused or the connection will time out because the LXD05 server is not listening on a network port at the moment. So what we need to do is run through those commands that we talked about on this side. So we'll do an LXC config show. And as you can see, we have an empty configuration for the LXD daemon on the LXD05 server right now. So what we need to do is set the HTTPS address like we talked about in the presentation. So we'll do an LXC config and you can do just edit here, and then you can go in here and you know manually type the YAML syntax. But if you don't want to do that, you can just do LXC config set, and then do core.https address equals, and then we'll just do colon 8443. And so that right there automatically created a network listener. And if you want to validate that the port is listening, you should be able to run netstat dash dash listening here. And of course, you'd have to install netstat to do that. Apparently, it's not installed by default here, but you can actually get which ports are listening by using the netstat command. Now, the other thing we need to do is to add our client as a trusted client. So to do that, we'll do lxc config, and then you'll see that there is this trust subcommand right down here. We'll do lxc config trust, and then we want to use this command right here, which will allow us to add a new trusted client. So we'll do LXC config trust add, take a look at the help really quick. As you can see, we don't have any mandatory arguments after that. However, when we run this command, you'll see that we're prompted for a client name. And my client's name is Artemis, so I'll just specify that. And so now we get this huge token right here. And all you need to do is copy that token to your clipboard. And then we'll come back to our client right here and add our new remote. So this time we'll be able to add the remote because the listener has been created on port 8443. So we'll go ahead and rerun our command here to add our remote server. It'll ask us to confirm the server's certificate fingerprint. We'll just hit Y for yes there. And then we should be prompted for the token. So this is where we just can do control V to paste in our authentication token. And that's all we have to do to set up the remote. So now our client here is trusted by the server and we can start issuing commands against that server. However, I'm also going to configure my second LXD server as a remote as well. So we'll just do LXC config set or dot HTTPS address equals 8443. And then we'll do the LXC remote add. Uh, actually it's LXC config trust add specify our name Artemis here, and we get a different token right here. And then we'll come back to our client. We'll say, I want to add Wyoming, and it'll just be wyoming.local as the address. And again, it's really nice because LXD automatically picks up the network listener config change and just uh, sets it up for you automatically as soon as you run it. So apparently MDNS is kind of acting up on me here. So I'll just do Wyoming as the host name. Then we'll paste in our token and now everything is good to go. So now I'm on my Windows client, but I'm communicating with the remote LXD engine on two different Linux hosts. So if I do LXC remote list, 
Let me bump the font size down a little bit there. Now you can see that I've got LXD05 right here, and I also have Wyoming right down here. So I have two different hosts. They're using the TLS authentication type, and they're using the LXD protocol because they're full LXD engines instead of the simple streams protocol for image servers. So now what I can do is start issuing commands against these remotes. But you'll notice that right over here on local, it says current. So current is basically an alias for default. It means that that is the server that commands are going to run against if I just run something like LXC list. Now, obviously, we don't have the LXD engine installed on Windows because it's simply not supported. So we need to switch the remote that we are operating on, or we can just change the remote default. So we'll do LXC remote list, or actually remote with no arguments here. And then we can change the default server by simply specifying the switch command right down here. So we'll do LXC remote switch, and we'll take a look at the help. And all we have to do is specify the name of the remote. So let's do LXD05. So now if we do an LXC remote list, we should see that LXD05 is now our current default host that commands are going to run against. All right, so now let's go ahead and do something like an LXC list here, and that'll list the remote virtual machines running on LXD05. As you can see, there are none currently running. Also, I could do an LXC image list, and that'll also run against the LXD05 server. As you can see, that server only has a single image here. But let's take a look at the images that are on the Wyoming host. So I could actually just override the remote here because when you run certain commands on LXC, you'll be able to actually specify the remote name followed by a colon right here. So instead of changing the default remote, I can simply say LXC image list Wyoming colon, and that'll list the images on the Wyoming server instead of the LXD05 server. So now one really great thing about being able to configure multiple remotes is that from my development workstation, I can actually issue commands to the LXD servers to copy images between the different servers. And there's lots of other operations that operate between multiple servers. You can actually move instances between different LXD servers, which is really cool. So again, having the remotes configured is really nice. But let's say that I wanted to take this Alpine image right here with this fingerprint and copy it over to my LXD05 server, which currently only has a Lunar Lobster image available. So what I can actually do is say LXC image copy, and this command allows me to copy images between multiple remotes. So I can take the source remote, and I can have a destination remote that is separate. So what I'll do is just make sure I copy that fingerprint right here to my clipboard, and then we'll do LXC image copy. And Wyoming already has that image. And you don't even have to specify the full fingerprint. I can just do a partial fingerprint here as long as it's unique. And then I can specify the remote that I want to copy the image to. So even though I'm not running the LXD engine on my local Windows system, because I can't, I can still use commands like the image copy command in order to replicate data between different servers. And it looks like we are having an issue with the server misbehaving right here. Not entirely sure what's going on there, but let's see if the copy command works a second time. <laughs> All right, so I had to take a quick break there to fix what was going on with the Wyoming server there. I just had to restart the multicast DNS service so that it would start picking that up. But then the other thing that I did is I also went to the LXC remote and I actually configured it using the IP address. I'm just having some internal DNS issues, but I was able to use the IP address successfully to configure it as a remote on my LXC client. And as you can see, we're now able to copy images between the different servers. So just to show that one more time, let's do an LXC image list command here find a different one that we want to copy, maybe this one right here. And then we'll do another copy command, paste in the fingerprint of that image. And in just a moment here, we should see that it's copying that image from Wyoming over to LXD05. 
So now that we know some commands that we can actually use to manage these servers, we can start to take these shell commands for LXC and put them into automation scripts so that we can start to kind of orchestrate the various operations that we need to perform on different servers. For example, if we want to spin up a bunch of virtual machines with certain configurations, we could put all of those into automation scripts and then run them. If we need to start up or shut down certain virtual machines at certain times of the day, we could use systemd timers or other types of cron scheduling systems in order to schedule those types of scripts. And we can do all of that from our central development workstation here if that is a good place for you to do it. Of course, you could use another server to do that kind of orchestration as well but it's really up to you where you want to run that kind of stuff. But in any case, hopefully you understand how remotes work with LXD, how to configure the network listener, how to configure the trust relationship between the server and the client system, and some of the different operations that you can perform. Also, if you run LXSeq here and take a look at some of these different commands, like the list command or the move command or any of these other management commands, you should be able to specify which remote you want to operate against using the LXC CLI with that remote colon syntax that we just took a look at with the image copy command. In any case, thanks again for joining me in this video. I hope you all are enjoying learning about LXD. I really enjoy using LXD on a regular basis. It's incredibly powerful and it just really gives you full control over your virtual infrastructure. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.